Hello, everyone. I'm Steven Stomberg, the CEO of Bitrix Global. I'm so happy to be here with you today virtually. I wish I could be there in person with all of you. Today, I'll be covering why institutions need to get serious about cryptocurrencies. So let's get started. Here's our table of contents. We're going to talk about the blockchain opportunity, institutional adoption, and the future. So blockchain is a hugely transformative technology. Um, it's a new paradigm for storage and sharing of information. So I, I like to think of how it's going to affect, first of all, the financial services industry. You know, they use all these very antiquated settlement systems and back office. And that's really what the blockchain is. You know, the Internet changed the way we interact with customers, but it didn't interact you know, sort of with the way that people change their back office. And that's what the blockchain is really going to do, in addition to being a, a huge payment and remittance you know, disruptor, which we can see on the left. So payments and remittances are being hugely disrupted in financial services, clearing and settlements. But then you know, we can start to see other applications for blockchain where it can start to move into supply chain and logistics, real estate, which is all done in a very old fashioned way, healthcare, um, retail, insurance and energy. So retail has obviously been hugely impacted already by the internet. But Again, the back office and the way that you're storing or delivering items and keeping track of them, that's not done in a very efficient way. Real estate, again, internet has been hugely transformative, like things like Zillow and how we sell houses, but behind and all the paperwork for transferring title and real estate, that can all be put onto the blockchain. So it's like sort of the next wave of this revolution. And again, we can just sort of look historically, you know, using the internet paradigm, like sort of internet 1.0, which was 1990 to 2000, you saw small dev teams building huge companies on new business models. You know, blockchain 1.0, which the next phase, which was like sort of 2016 to 2020, you started to see community developers and entrepreneurs building new business models. And, you know, blockchain 2.0 is um, 2020 onwards, mass adoption, which we're just seeing right now. We're sort of at a very interesting inflection point for crypto. You know, we're seeing retail and institutional adoption is only set to grow for both crypto and blockchain technology. So remember, cryptocurrency is a use of blockchain technology. It's the most widely talked about, but it's really blockchain is the broader sort of category and cryptocurrency is the subset. So right now, 21% of banks are using blockchain for settlement for transfer of funds, and they're not using it really that in depth. That just means they're, they're touching it or they're trying out Bitcoin. So you know, it's being tested or leveraged um, you know, the, as a back-end process for many banks. They haven't wanted to do it. Remember, they're happy with their awful old systems where they can charge huge fees, but now they have no choice. It's either do this or get left behind like Barnes & Noble did in the bookselling game with Amazon. Right? So there's only more room to grow for retail cryptocurrency adoption. Right now, only 7% of Americans have used or own cryptocurrency, which is crazy given how much press it's taking. But you compare that to 32% and 21% of people in Nigeria and Vietnam have used or own cryptocurrency, respectively. And everyone from Amazon to Apple, JP Morgan, Citibank, they're all hiring for individuals with cryptocurrency and blockchain experience. So it's kind of like the early days of the internet boom. Institutional adoption. So interesting quote, which we like, retail is selling on exchanges while institutional investors are simply not buying as much as before rather than selling. And that's Philip Gradwell. He's a Chainalysis chief economist. And this was after the May 10th sell-off in crypto. So we saw another big sell-off, but you know, we saw retail selling, but institutions were just, buy we're still buying, but just not as much. That's interesting. And you know, institutions obviously buy a lot more. You know, a few institutions could hold a lot more than a lot more retail clients. So they obviously move the needle a lot more. And that stability in markets, which we didn't have the last time around, institutions weren't participating in 2017, which is why I think we haven't seen you know, the massive correction that we did back in 2017. So of the institutions, you know, hedge funds tend to be the most nimble, obviously more than a bank or some sort of boring, long-only asset manager. So hedge funds are actively investing in digital assets and cryptocurrencies right now. 20% of the hedge funds are already investing. And you know, hedge funds as a group is a huge pool of AUM or assets under management. So we have some major brand names such as uh, you know, Paul Tudor Jones, his firm is called Tudor. There's a firm called Brevin Howard, run by Alan Howard, and Point72, which is run by Steve Cohen. They have all either invested in cryptocurrencies or they're considering launching funds focusing just on crypto and blockchain. You know, a recent survey also showed that 17% of the hedge fund CFOs said they expect to invest 
more than 10% of their investment holdings in cryptocurrencies in five years. So remember, they had zero, and now you have this trillion, you know, hundreds of billions of assets. If they take 10% and start putting into crypto, that's a lot of money chasing crypto. It's going to have a huge impact. Um, Ray Dalio, who runs Bridgewater, which is the world's largest hedge fund, said, I'd rather have Bitcoin than a bond. That's obviously because of money printing and inflation. Carl Icahn, another investing icon, said, quote, crypto assets are here to stay in one form or another. And Mark Lassery, who runs Avenue Capital, another big hedge fund guy, the probability as more and more people keep using Bitcoin is going to keep moving up. So again, you can see huge ringing endorsements from some of the biggest names in the industry. So for trading and investing, with Bitcoin being the best performing asset class in the last decade, institutions are taking a second look. So it's pretty hard if you're one of these traditional asset managers like Goldman or Fidelity telling everyone with their balanced portfolio and be happy with your 5 or 6%. Bitcoin's been up massively, but even this year, some of the altcoins have been up 7,000%. So if you're, you know, if you, it's pretty, you know, hard story to tell your longstanding clients why they're just getting sort of like be happy with 5%. Or, or if it, even if it's down on an inflation-adjusted basis. So Goldman has finally launched a crypto derivatives trading desk. They're now moving beyond Bitcoin and launching Ethereum futures. Fidelity is going to be launching a Bitcoin ETF, while Invesco is launching a cryptocurrency economy ETF. State Street has launched State Street Digital, which will focus on crypto, CBDCs, which are central bank digital currencies, blockchain and tokenization, and Standard Charter is even planning to establish a cryptocurrency brokerage and exchange platform in the UK and Europe for institutional clients. So they're saying all the right things. You know, they haven't actually done most of these things, and it will take them time to implement it. They're finally allowing their clients to hold cryptocurrency. Now, why are they doing this? Because if they didn't, they would have just taken all their money out and put it in Coinbase, So they and then they can't charge fees. So that would have been a problem for them. So right now, you're seeing Morgan Stanley allowing clients to invest in two crypto funds for exposure. Goldman is looking at offering a full spectrum of investments in Bitcoin and digital assets. UBS and Citibank are both exploring offering cryptocurrency services to their wealthy clients after they had a huge surge of interest from clients. Again, meaning they're freaking out because their clients are all leaving and taking the fee paying income elsewhere. So they have no choice but to do this. They didn't want to do it, but you can't beat them, join them. And you know, eventually, I've always said that these banks will do it only when they figure out how they can charge their clients money to do it. And now they have to do it. You know, the, the downside risk of not doing it is higher than waiting and doing it on your own pace. So they're just doing some things quickly and then you know, they'll figure it out. It's good for the industry. And retail banking, traditional retail banks are not meeting the demand from their customers for cryptocurrency. You know, they're going to be the slowest to move. The wealth managers are ultra high net worth. So you know, banks can see the writing on the wall. Their customers are already, again, taking money out, sending it to crypto exchanges in mass volume, or even platforms like Robinhood, which are offering cryptocurrency trading, which are already competing with the banks, sort of the fintechs. So the banks are getting squeezed all around by fintech players and then the new crypto fintech players. Um, crypto purchases through bank accounts may be on the horizon. You know, custody from um, New York DIG rolling out the ability to buy and sell Bitcoin directly through a bank account. Traditional banks, as we know, they're very slow to move. And as usual, no notable announcements. So they haven't even announced they're doing things. They're just going to kind of you know, keep their head in the sand. But 60% of crypto owners want to use their bank to invest in crypto. And we're seeing new institutions entering the market. Um, you know, They're all waiting to offer cryptocurrencies, new players. So right now, there's 150 to 200 active, dedicated crypto hedge funds. 81% of those funds were launched between 2017 and 2020. You know, firms like Grayscale and Bitwise are launching ETF products that are allowing both retail and institutional investors like RAs to get exposure to cryptocurrencies. So Grayscale is a crypto-only um, fund, boring fund manager, and they're the ones who are now, Morgan Stanley is offering their fund to offer their clients access because they haven't figured it out. So the other fintechs such as PayPal, Square, Revolut, Robinhood, they're filling demand for cryptocurrencies from retail investors with exchanges like Bittrex and Bitrix Global filling in the demand for cryptocurrencies from institutional investors. So again, it's a, a lot like the 90s where you saw massive disruption, and here you're seeing it from all sides. So what do we see for the future? Clearly, it's going to be digital over conventional. Uh, digital securities will be bigger than cryptocurrencies. So right now, everything's focused around crypto and utility tokens, which are tokens that are not considered securities, right? 
But over time, you can tokenize everything. So every security, every sort of asset class can be represented by a token. These will be considered securities or digital securities. So securities markets should be able to operate as efficiently as the token markets, right? So token markets operate 24-7. You can buy Bitcoin 24-7. But if you want to buy your Apple stock on a stock exchange, um, you have to go through your broker. It takes a few days to settle. And you have to wait for the stock exchange to be open, which is not on a bank holiday. And it's only sort of nine to five. So that's really inefficient and doesn't make any sense. And obviously, if you had a tokenized version of Apple or some other sort of um, traditional security, you can trade 24-7. So new classes of assets can be securitized for tokenization, um, mostly to institutional investors. Again, like real estate, we talked about intellectual property, high value individual assets like art or a classic car. So you can start to have 24-7 liquidity on traditionally illiquid assets, which is pretty interesting, and a, and a global investor reach. New business models can be built on hybrid cryptocurrency and digital security tokens, um, returns to equity holders are enhanced by the use of cryptocurrency. Early and growth stage companies can, can raise capital through security token offerings. Imagine you can just get rid of Silicon Valley and, and the whole VC um, community. You can just go and issue through a token. It's like sort of like crowdfunding globally through a token on day one. And you can have lower friction using blockchain, obviously, greater participation and also financial inclusion because people can buy in very small sizes and get access to these types of early stage investments, which to now has only been for you know a small set of the 0.01%. So again, let's look at the existing equity markets. Like we have these boring, horrible clearing systems are really inefficient and complex. Trading small volumes can be expensive and take many days. It's inaccessible for many people around the world. When markets are accessible, they don't provide the option to buy fractional shares. Trading can be really costly. You know, they charge large, large fees per trade. Markets aren't 24-7. Again, it's 2021. Why does this exist? Because it can. And these banks and stock exchanges have no incentive to change their very profitable business model, which is about maximizing profit, not about maximizing user interface or financial inclusion. But the good news, like the internet did with retail, Blockchain is going to democratize traditional financial markets, and it's the Amazon moment for traditional financial markets. So right now, using blockchain technology, and you can do this now, there are tokenized versions of stocks, US dollar, USDT, Bitcoin, altcoins, gold. You can do all of this right now on our exchange and have this your entire portfolio diversified and in blockchain and tradable 24-7. So again, it's just the, the tip of the iceberg, but imagine when the whole world moves this direction. The future impact of tokenization Again, lower costs opens up the market for any asset class and it's trackable and transparent, which markets are not now, which again, the banks love it that way. But, you know, unfortunately for them, it's not going to stay that way. So we talked about tokenized stocks. That's a security token offering. So right now you have what's called an initial coin offering that was popularized in 2017. That's just for a utility token. You buy a token, but it doesn't represent an equity ownership of the company. It's just a token that provides some utility. It's kind of like a frequent flyer model at an airline. Like you have utility on the airline, but you don't own stock in the airline. Then you have what was called initial exchange offerings, which you know became kind of in vogue after the 2017 bubble. It's really the same thing. It's just a utility token project using a lower cost of capital to issue a token. And now you're seeing some of these things going on decentralized exchanges um, or an IDO. So these are all, again, utility tokens. They're not security tokens. Security token offering, it's, it's just a token, but it, it's what it represents that's different. It represents an equity ownership of some asset class or a company. And that token is treated like a security because a securities regulator, wherever you're selling it, will say that's a security. So it's really about how you sell the item, not how you sort of trade it or create it that's different. But again, using blockchain, you can totally innovate the way that you know traditional securities are created and they're traded. The whole point of the securities token offering, it will make fundraising more economical and accessible. They're easy tracking of ownership, right? Like right now, for a lot of securities, they're still physical and they have like a physical register. And if you lose them, I mean, it's amazing in 2021, right? Um, reduces fraud and fractional ownership opens smaller investors to access new investment opportunities. So right now, like a, a Tesla shares, you know, $700. Not everyone has that kind of money. You get a digital version of the token, like we have on our exchange. You can buy whatever size you, you want. You've heard a lot about recently is decentralized finance or DeFi. So an exchange like Bittrex is centralized finance in the crypto and blockchain world. But decentralized 
it exists in the non-crypto world. I mean, you have peer-to-peer lending and, and sort of fintechs that exist. So DeFi is sort of the, the buzzword for how to do peer-to-peer in the crypto world. So it's a new way to execute financial transactions. You know, to you're, you and the buyer and seller are just technically brought together directly. There's no intermediary or clearinghouse that you go through. So right now, you're seeing a lot of stable coins trading on these lending platforms, yield farming, liquidity mining, and the market has just boomed. It went from you know less than a billion dollars total value in May 2020 to 85 billion in May 2021. That's exponential growth. I mean, that's crazy. DeFi could be more disruptive than Bitcoin to the financial sector. That's the ING block, blockchain lead, Hervé Francois, who said that. I think the challenge for DeFi is going to be around the, how they comply with regulations. Because Just because you're bringing two people together, you're still going to be viewed as responsible for making sure there's no money laundering and that there's KYC. So another thing that's really hot right now in the crypto and blockchain world are non-fungible tokens. So what is it? So it's a provably unique, ownable digital item. It allows only uh, any digital item to be owned and tangibly valued. So I think the way to think about it, there's two kinds of tokens. There's fungible tokens, which are, you don't care which token you get, like a dollar. You don't care which dollar bill you have. They all have the same value. Same with the Bitcoin. You don't care which Bitcoin you own. They're all worth the same. But a non-fungible token, which is a unique token, you care which one you own. You, you want the one that represents you know, the Picasso and not the crayon drawing your kid made that's from the refrigerator, right? So those tokens will be very different in sort of how they're valued. Um, so right now, the biggest use for NFTs are digital art, not even real art, virtual collectibles, and we're seeing a bit in real estate. But you know, I think you'll start to see huge use of NFTs for real estate and real world assets, real world art. Um, again, things can be settled more efficiently and tradable on the blockchain and with no fraud uh, possibility. So it's, it's a lot more interesting. So I think we've covered a lot today. That's uh, all that I have to really discuss. Thank you very much for your time.